Welcome to the Lifestyle as Medicine Lecture for the Planet with Rochester Lifestyle and Medicine Institute. I am Dr. Ted Barnett coming to you live from the annual conference of the American Association of Family Physicians here in Phoenix. I'm actually hiding out in the food court where there's nobody at the moment. Tonight our lecture is with Jim Hicks, Jay Morris Hicks, and his title would be Addressing Sustainability Hurdles with a Shift to a Plant-Based Diet. So I'm so excited to have him here. Here's our agenda for tonight. Um, I'll be introducing our um, guest speaker, as well as Dr. Kerry Graff, who, will be, who is our medical director, and who will be handling questions at the end. Uh, I will actually be disappearing after this introduction because I need to go be at our table. Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute has a table tonight at this uh, um, large conference. We're very excited about that. So at 7.35, we're gonna turn things over to Jim Hicks for the presentation. Around 8.15 or so, we'll go to Q&A. And at 8.30, we will officially adjourn. If things are going um, hot and heavy, we may uh, continue into the lobby for another 10 or 15 minutes or so. But uh, I think we're gonna be really efficient tonight and we should be out of here by 8.30. Um, these are our uh, programs that uh, we'd love it if you'd uh, try it out. If you're a patient or a participant, or if you're a physician, we'd love to um, have you partner with you uh, with these. We have our own 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart which we consider to be the prescription for chronic disease. We also have the LIFT project to uh, lift uh, people's moods. And both of those are certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And then we also have health coaching, both in groups and individual sessions. And please check out our website, rochesterlifestylemedicine.org to find out more about those. Uh, we also have another program called the Pale Blue Dot Community, which if you are here, you probably had to use to, uh, to uh, sign up and uh, the uh, Lifestyle Medicine video recordings, transcripts and chat logs uh, will be there along with the discussion spaces that you might find interesting. It's a simple, easy to use interface and we have our events, courses and programs all housed uh, there. Uh, there's also an app that you can uh, download for your phone and it does, um, you, you have access to a, uh, a free membership and that's uh, probably how you got here. But if you'd like to uh, have a little more use of the uh, platform, if there's a $5 a month free, but uh, sorry, $5 a month fee for the first uh, 30 days is free. Our lecturer tonight is Jay Morris Hicks. He's a former engineer, consultant, and executive for over 30 years. He holds a BS in industrial engineering and earned an MBA while serving as an officer in the U.S. Coast Guard in Honolulu. He earned a certificate in plant-based nutrition from E. Cornell on the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, where he served on the board for many years. In 2002, he became curious about the optimal diet for humans and began a comprehensive study of what we eat from a global perspective. In 2004, Jim began noting that our future as a species was riding on our food choices and later realized that we must address human endeavors that threaten our survival as a species in order to preserve our fragile ecosystem. His long-term vision began in his three books, Healthy Eating, Healthy World with Jay Stanfield Hicks, Four Leaf Guide to Vibrant Health, co-authored by our very own Dr. Kerry Graff, our uh, medical director, and Outcry, Urgent Alarms for, from, from Our Planet and What We Can Do About Them with Stuart Scott. He has also posted over 1,400 articles at hpjmh.com. <clears throat> and uh, Jim's work aims at waking up the leaders of the world to the fact that animal agriculture is the leading driver of climate change, though many leaders have little incentive to promote a dietary shift that could be unpopular, at least at first, and not good for business. Jim continues to search for leaders who have the courage to promote to, to promote health, hope, and harmony on planet Earth. So, so welcome, uh, Jim, and welcome, Dr. Graff. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. So, Jim, if you'd like to start sharing, please. And Dr. Graff, we'll see you after the presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great to be here. Bye. Okay. Sure. Lifestyle is medicine for the planet. Um, my journey began in 1965 when I changed my major to industrial engineering almost 60 years ago. I uh, did that to focus on system optimization. And so the system we're going to be talking about tonight is kind of illustrated in that image below, which is the cover of my first book, Healthy Eating, Healthy World. And that's all about the system optimization of planet Earth. As for systems, five grossly unsustainable situations comprise our current system of living on this planet. Number one, overpopulation. We're still adding a net, net six million people every month on the planet. Number two, never-ending growth economy, capitalism. Number three, extremely harmful and wasteful manner we are living. And number four, 
Steady rise, rising consumption of meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. Number five, selfish, ignorant, and irresponsible global leadership. I'm near certain that there's only one action that can possibly buy us enough time to resolve all five of these situations, and that is downsizing the global animal agricultural industry by at least 50% before 2030, and that's not many years away. That's via individual food choices by billions of people. Meanwhile, uh, this week in the New York Times, big article entitled, Our Taste for Flesh Has Exhausted the Earth. And that, that, that image there basically shows uh, kind of the percentage of the uh, trees that we've taken down, which is most of the trees on planet Earth. So are we, uh, from the article, are we ready for the future of meat? Worldwide, 80 billion animals are slaughtered every year for meat. Raising all those animals has already claimed most of the world's farmland. It has led to zoonotic diseases and vast de deforestation. It has polluted air and water and spewed planet heating gases into the atmosphere. It has also enabled many more people to eat meat more often than ever before, which has in turn put pressure on governments to both keep meat prices affordable and reduce its climate footprint. Lab-grown meat, which the article is all about, is not the answer. But that's just where we are. So what is the answer? Uh, I'm going to answer that with my talking about my 52-year career that has led me to a possible solution. Four phases of that career. Phase one was nine years, process, process improvement consultant from 1972 to 81. And that was primarily in the apparel and textile industries, my clients. And so one of my clients hired me, and that began phase two, corporate executive positions. That was 18 years of my career, from 81 to 99. And then uh, being in the fashion industry, uh, I was working with Polo Ralph Lauren as a, I was the first executive VP of the company. And that's all about planned obsolescence. And that just didn't sit too well for this industrial engineer that was trying to, to make things more efficient. So uh, when I finally parted company with the fashion industry, I decided I did not ever want to work for anybody else again. And so I started my own executive search firm which uh, was in business primarily from 1999 to 2010. I call this era my transition phrase, phase from corporate executive to environmental activist. And during those years, since I owned the firm, I could, I could do whatever I wanted during the day. And I did a lot of studying about food during those years. And then phase four, which we're in now, writer, speaker, and activist, 14 years and counting. It was, it was in 1988, mid-phase two, when I first began learning about the health benefits of the natural diet for our species, plant-based foods. But it was 15 years later when I finally connected the dots regarding the crucial role of our food choices when it comes to not only our health, but also to the health of the biosphere that keeps us alive. By the way, this uh, there's a link to all the slides of this presentation at the top of my uh, website at hpjmh.com. So it all began at Auburn University in 1965 when I changed my major to industrial and systems engineering. Up, up until that time, I, I think I'd been in, in, in aviation management or something that didn't really make any sense. So in industrial systems engineering, uh, it's all about improving processes. And uh, as a benefit, as a bonus rather, I I was I was on the co-op program and I worked for Southern Railway every other quarter for 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 five years that I was in school and so I had almost two years of the five years was working in an industrial and systems engineering uh, uh, department. So sixteen years into my career. My first exposure to healthy eating it was in 1988. I ran a 10K race in my hometown of Ridgewood, New Jersey. And during that race, they took photos and I ordered a big one, a poster. And then I, when I got that poster, I, I was shocked by how bad I looked. 
running that 10k race so i went i, I said boy I, I am looking really bad for my age I, I went shopping the next day in new york city for health books and i found this one fit for life by harvey and marilyn diamond uh featured nothing but fruit in the morning encouraged eating lots of whole plants suggested minimal meat dairy eggs and fish i lost over 20 pounds in six months i had to alter all of my suits and then I went on and off that diet for the next 15 years. Uh, every time my suits would get a little tight, I'd go back on the diet. Uh, fast forward to 2023, I got serious about the optimal diet, adopting a permanent uh, whole food plant-based diet. Excuse me, that should be 20, 2003. I, I got that wrong. What triggered that shift? Oddly enough, the 9-11 tragedy played a major role. I flew into New York City that fateful day to meet with several clients. That tragedy almost a lot annihilated the executive search industry. As you can imagine, nobody wanted to hire any executives in a time of uncertainty like that. So we were just about to go under in 2002, uh, a year and a half after that tragedy, and and a money-making idea is born. So after speaking to a group of Georgia Tech alumni, uh, my title of my uh, talk was Get a Life, Then Get a Job, My Seven Secrets. So one secret was all about taking charge of your health. So and, and, and building on that, that thought, uh, I had an idea with my partners, there were, there were five of us in the search firm. I said, you know what, that the, uh, the feedback from that seminar was so powerful. I think that we could have get a life seminars in Atlanta, fly people in, uh, 10 AM to 4 PM for $199. And, um, so we were all set to do that. Each of us took one of those seven secrets. I took health, uh, health and diet. Uh, so the seminars never did happen because during my research, I became obsessed with what I was learning about the optimal diet for humans. So by the end of January 2003, I had studied the works of T. Colin Campbell, Joel Furman, Neil Barnard, John McDougall, and many more. Surprisingly, I quickly lost about 20 pounds. I never took statin drugs that were being advised by my physician at the time. My grocery bill was cut in half. I canceled my colonic irrigation procedure. Then along came Memorial Day weekend, 2003, and I discovered two books. And these books were all about the environmental benefits of plant-based eating. Diet for a New America by John Robbins and Mad Cowboy by Howard Lyman and Glenn Mercer, who's now a good friend of mine. So after reading those two books, on Monday morning, I finally concluded oh my God, we're eating the wrong food for our species. And my life has not been the same since. But what about the other six secrets in those seminars that never did happen? Uh, here, here were the seven. Lead a simple, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm pretty much doing all of these now. Lead a simple, uncluttered life. Uh, number three, purge yourself of any relationships that don't bring you joy. Number four, follow your passion and find a way to make a living doing what you love. Number five, learn to live on far less than you can earn and achieve financial freedom as early in life as possible. Get involved with serious fun, things that bring you joy and satisfaction. And seven, sort out your feelings about faith, hope, and the things that motivate you to be all that you can be. This is a very important piece, assessing your major definite purpose in life. And I have done that. Fast forward to 2024. Why is the de rapid downsizing of animal agriculture so important? Because on a per calorie basis, on average, animal-based foods require over 10 times as much land, water, and energy as do plant-based foods. 10 times. So think about it. If we cannot take the animal out of the equation when it comes to feeding ourselves, we will never learn to live in harmony with nature, thereby placing the future of our civilization and our species in serious jeopardy. So why don't more people get it? 
Why haven't scores of leaders all over the world ever addressed animal agriculture before? Uh, it starts with the protein myth, also known as locked brain syndrome. Because of the mistaken yet almost ubiquitous belief that humans actually need to eat animal protein to be healthy, a host of incredibly powerful plant-based nutrition, plant-based solutions to the world's most serious health, hunger, and sustainability crises never even make it to the table for consideration. So what's holding us back? 10 factors. Number one, most people in the developed world do not know we can get all the nutrients we need, including protein, from an ultra delicious whole food plant-based diet. Number two, most Americans have been eating some combination of meat, dairy, eggs, and fish every day for their entire lives. Number three, we all learned how to eat from our parents who were all committed to providing the healthiest foods for their families. My mother, my father did the same. We had animal-based foods at every meal. Number four, most medical doctors are not eating plant-based diets and are not recommending such a diet to their patients. Number five, most people know that fruit, grains, legumes, potatoes, and veggies are good for them, but those whole plant-based foods comprise a tiny percentage of their food choices estimated below 10% of their calories in the USA from those foods. So factors six through 10, what's holding us back? Six, most people simply are not aware that diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity can be quickly reversed by simply shifting to a whole food plant-based way of eating. Number seven, most people simply cannot believe that agencies like the USDA and the UN are not telling us the truth about nutrition. Number eight, most are unaware that our top schools of nutrition have been bought and paid for by the meat, dairy, and egg industries. Number nine, most, most believe that if we should not be eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish, we would surely be hearing that crucial information from elected officials, medical doctors, and the international media. And number 10, we all know this is true. If any political candidate anywhere ran on a platform that included eliminating animal-based foods for health and environmental reasons, they would never be elected. Did I mention that our schools of nutrition have been bought and paid for? Now, this is, this is an excerpt from an email that Colin Campbell sent me two months ago, July 10th. Uh, he says, Jim, you may recall my last seminar at Cornell 15 years ago. I was in the audience, by the way. And the guy from the animal science department that asked who had allowed me in the lecture hall to give that seminar. Shortly thereafter, the department director removed my picture as an emeritus professor from the lobby wall, erased my personal website, and refused to acknowledge that I had authored the China study. Colin. Essentially, Cornell did their best to make T. Colin Campbell disappear, and it's continued on uh, forevermore. And, and that, that's a picture of the, of the milk bottle that's outside the Dairy Science Building. Guess who paid for that, that little trophy? So here's another troubling story from eight years ago. I wrote a letter to then Vice President Biden, February 1st, 2016. He was directing Obama's Moonshot Cancer Initiative at the time. By the way, that's a uh, that's a poster size that I uh, and I still got that poster. I keep it in my oven because I don't use my oven to cook anything, and so that's the size of that thing. Uh, after receiving no response from the attempts to connect with Biden, this I, I sent this giant 24 18 by 24 inches poster. Again, no response from the White House. But Dr. Campbell and I finally did have a 60 minute phone conference with the top official who was directing the Moonshot Initiative for the vice president. After that one hour call, we never heard from him again. Here's the beginning of that letter. Excerpt, Honorable Joe Biden. Dear Vice President Biden, by definition, your Moonshot Initiative suggests that it is an ambitious, exploratory, and groundbreaking type of project. If your initiative really is all of those things, Hopefully, you will step outside the cancer industry 
And believe you me, it is an industry and they are not interested in lowering their revenues. Get outside that industry during your initial exploration and it, you will consider possible courses of action that could lead to the end of cancer as we know it, along with the trillion dollar industry that benefits from his, its existence. That obviously did not happen. Back to 2024. Uh, this is the top of my website at hpjmh.com. Two ambitious initiatives for the rapid downsizing of animal agriculture. Uh, initiative number one is, is called Game Plan 2024 for Reversing Climate Change. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the uh, my talk here. Uh, Game Plan 2024. Here's a little preview of that. Reversing Climate Change. Um, now, first of all, I'm well aware of, of the of the bad press that Mayor Adams is getting now. In fact, uh, AOC, uh, Representative AOC, New York, New York representative, uh, wrote an article today in the New York Times and basically called for him to step down now. Well, I'm not I'm not saying that he's. He's the, the greatest human on earth of the greatest mayor ever. But I do know that he wrote this book, Healthy at Last, after visiting with uh, Caldwell Esselstyn. And he was going blind. He was obese. He was, he was, he was having a, a tough time. And he wrote Healthy at Last. And I, and I have concluded that he is the most influential person in the world who totally gets it about food. So if he's going to get thrown out, he, he's got to run for re-election next year. Uh, I would like to see him just, just kind of hang on for a while, quit trying to run for re-election, and, and do what we're talking about, this, this uh, game plan 2024 20, 20, full-time. But for the past year, we've been promoting a two-hour session in New York City with seven prominent journalists hosted by Mayor Adams, along with seven others, Dr. Silas Rao, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Abraham Ort, who is a uh, Princeton meteorologist, retired, Dr. Michelle McMacken, who I know personally works in the mayor's sphere of uh, hospitals. Greta Thunberg, we could get her to come. Think about the, being the mayor of New York. You can get anybody in the world to get on your Zoom call with you. And Rachel Atchison, who actually works for the mayor, and I have met her and yours truly. Our goal will be to inspire seven or more courageous journalists to make this project their number one story for the rest of their lives. Here they are, the ones that I picked, uh, seven out of more than a dozen widely respected journalists who could move the needle regarding how we can quickly weaken the leading driver of climate change. Uh, by their first names, Diane, Jane, Katie, Christian, Anderson, Ali, and Chris. Once enough journalists of integrity fully grasp exactly what's at stake, they will know what to do. The beauty of it is that it's all about individual food choices that people can make on their own because they're not going to hear this from any elected official anytime soon. Moving on to a related topic, why I don't like the term vegan. It's all about what you don't eat when what you do eat is far more important. As a vegan, you could eat nothing but Diet Coke and potato chips. You'd be a dead vegan in six weeks. Most restaurants only have one vegan option that is rarely, if ever, a, a whole food plant-based meal. Number three, unless people adopt a health-promoting whole food plant-based kind of vegan diet, they are not likely to stick with it. And I have seen that. As for me, I can... Just scan the restaurant menu and see what kinds of grains and veggies come with the entrees. I order two of those sides and tell them to adjust the price accordingly. And I usually save at least 50% on my meal. And then it's urging everyone to simply go, go vegan is simply not working. So consider this factoid. There are now more ex-vegans in the USA than there are vegans. And why? Because of those first few points. It's, it's just no fun being vegan unless you are improving your health with whole food, plant-based eating. 
So we must urgently promote a healthful, whole food, plant-based way of eating that saves dollars, saves lives, and saves nature's ability to keep us alive. So I call it the four leaf, uh, the four leaf uh, principle. Uh, Dr. Kerry Graff and I wrote a book called The Four Leaf Guide, but I was sitting with Colin Campbell on his porch in, in New York, and I showed him an idea that I had uh, to create a system of eating that was based on his definition of the optimal diet for humans. And he has put this in writing, the closer we get to eating a diet of whole plant-based foods, the better off we will be. Focusing on what we do eat, not what we're avoiding. It has implied wiggle room and you find out where you are in two minutes with the fourleafsurvey.com. Now you look at the four leaf levels. One leaf is over 20% of your calories from whole food, plant-based, whole, whole plant-based foods. Two leaf is 40 to 60, three leaf is 60 to 80, and four leaf is 80 to 100. Well, guess what? 90% of the U.S. population and most of the developed world eating well below the one leaf level. An estimated 90%, less than 20% of their calories from whole plants, the vast majority is deriving less than 10%. Uh, there's a survey, this survey, the this was uh, updated in 2019. Uh, you can find it easily at fourleafprogram.com. Four is 12 multiple choice questions. And we've, we've found that there, there's been very few complaints about this, this little survey. And the only ones that I've received in the, in the 12 years that it's been in existence have been from health providers who uh, scored three leaf when they know damn well they're eating four leaf. And so I went back and adjusted the algorithm a little bit so that it makes it a little bit easier for those people to make four leaf uh, status. Um, so where do we stand as a species and a civilization? My friend James Cameron wrote something to a note to me in a note to me one time. He was angry about something that I'd written about uh, some of his colleagues and so he wrote this little paragraph there uh, you see on the cover of Outcry. And I later went back to him and I said, James, uh, would you approve for me to use that, what you wrote in that memo uh, uh, on the cover of Outcry, which is uh, urgent alarms for our planet and what we can do about them. So here's what Cameron said. The world is completely delusional and going to hell in a handbasket as fast as humanly possible. The only relevant question is, how do we make the crash as soft a landing as possible for some kind of continuation of human civilization? Good question, James. So my bottom line is we're not winning the game of influencing billions, millions of eaters to just adopt whole food, plant-based eating around the world. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, there are now more vegans in the USA than ever before, but that there are more big more vegans, uh, ex-vegans than there are vegans in the USA, according to one poll, which I happen to believe based on my own observations. Especially me, we're not even close to getting started down this path. My own success rate has been horrible. Since 2003, when I suddenly concluded that we were eating the wrong food for our species, I've written three books, thousands of blogs, and have made many presentations around the globe. That said, how many people have I personally influenced to join me in eating a whole food plant-based diet? And I got to be honest and say it's probably less than 100 people. And I use my Stonington Harbor Yacht Club as an example. I know there, there are 500 members and I know most of them by name. Most of them know that I'm the guy that orders veg, veg, vegan meal when he comes to the club. Uh, many of those have heard about my books, uh, but you know, you don't, proselytizing doesn't work with, with uh, this kind of a very personal topic. So I don't really talk about it to those people. Uh, and I also have to add my family this. Uh, I've got, I've got uh, four grown grandchildren, one in college, three have graduated college. None of them are eating whole food plant-based. But my, my 
primary success in life has been my son and daughter, both of whom are eating whole food, plant-based, and I don't think they would have ever gotten there if it hadn't been for my work. So my own failure is why I'm promoting the Mayor Adams Game Plan 2024, because if we are something like that, because if we enlighten those journalists, it just might work. So one more thing before I close and we get to the discussion here, it's about the bright green lies we're being told uh, by these, uh, these folks here over on the left, the environmental MG NGOs. Which of these two scenarios cause less harm to the planet? That's the book, Bright Green Lies. It's by Derek Jensen. I, I recommend it. So which of these two, two scenarios would cause less harm to the planet? Number one, all, call, all cars traveling 100 miles per gallon or all cars traveling just one mile per gallon. Without giving it much thought, most people in the big greens would respond that the least harmful scenario would be the one with all cars traveling at 100 miles per gallon, but not so fast. Let's consider a world where all cars traveled just one mile per gallon. It prompts me to ask five questions. How many cars would there be globally? Not many. How many freeways would there be? None. Would there be affordable cross-country high-speed rail service across the United States? Yes. Would homes be smaller and closer together so as to make take better advantage of local public transportation? Yes. And number five, would the natural world comprise a much larger portion of the earth and be thriving far more than it is now? Yes, thank God. You get the point. The Big Greens have convinced us that an unlimited number of people can live indefinitely on this planet just as long as we power everything with renewable energy. That way of thinking is sheer lunacy, and it will likely kill us all before 2100. In closing, how can we convince those highly regarded media folks to begin focusing only on this topic? by helping them fully understand the enormity of what's at stake. When I think about the singular importance of working to save the natural world that sustains us, I'm reminding of what, reminded of what General George Patton said about war in 1944. Compared to war, all other forms of human endeavor shrink to insignificance. Here's what I'm saying 80 years later. Compared to saving our ecosystem, all other forms of human endeavor shrink to insignificance. And I believe that with every, every bone, every molecule in my body. So what am I doing these days in my failure to get my job done? I'm smelling the roses and I'm enjoying life, but I'm never giving up. A former Coast Guard officer, this is how I start my day. This is Fort Trumbull, the original site of the Coast Guard Academy in New London. So that's the three-masted schooner Eagle behind the uh, bush, the tree there. Uh, I start out my day with a seven, 75 minute walk in New London. I go to Fort Trumbull. I see Canada geese and I see the USCG training vessel. And that's usually about seven o'clock in the morning. My first book, Healthy Eating, Healthy World with Son Jason. Uh, you can get it for for less than $10 on Amazon these days. Uh, the other two books are free, free eBooks. I'm on top of my website at hbjmh.com. You can find these, these two books, Four Leaf Guide to Vibrant, Vibrant Health, one I wrote with Carrie Graff and, and our 2020 book, Outcry. So my old business cards have been replaced with mission cards. And I have these, I bought a couple of thousand of these because. I'm not going to move anytime soon, and I want to have, not ever run out. Engineer, writer, big picture, picture guy, promoting health, hope, and harmony on planet Earth. And that's the logo, the image from my first book. And finally, here are my new conversation starting license plates in Connecticut. USCG for me as a United States Coast Guard veteran. It's United States Coast Guard for me. 
And it's also United Saving Civilization Group for Mother Earth. So here's my primary websites. Uh, you can find How Healthy You're Eating online, poorleafsurvey.com. Uh, for lowering the cost of health care and large organizations, you can go to archbyfourleaf.com. Uh, for environmental reasons, Outcry is only available. It always has only been available as an ebook. So I can uh, now escape here and uh, pull Gary Graff into the mix to field any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Jim. That was just a wonderful presentation and a great overview of your life and uh, the process of thinking at it uh, through all of this and truly uh, the big picture of all of it, how much it matters. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I met Jim uh, back when I was doing primary care uh, practice and I had gone whole food plant-based myself after watching Forks Over Knives and got a lot healthier. And then um, I ended up uh, basically patients were asking me what I was doing. Um, I wasn't really talking about what I was doing, but um, it was very obvious. I lost 25 pounds in three months without even trying, without, you know, going hungry and really cleared up a whole bunch of other medical things. So patients were asking me what I was doing and I'm like, oh, I'm eating up a really healthy diet and uh, I'd have the much forks over knives and they'd come back and they'd say, oh, well, you know, I, I get it, but I was already doing pretty well. And But you'd actually go through what they were eating and it was not good. They were about 20% of their calories from, were from whole plants, even when they thought they were doing well. So I looked for something that would, um, that would be able to kind of help people gauge how many of their calories are coming from whole plants. Um, and the only thing that I could find was the four leaf survey. So I reached out to Jim and asked if I could use his survey with my patients, and he graciously uh, granted me permission to do so, uh, as long as I reported back how everybody did. And so over the next year, um, I was giving him feedback on how people were doing with it. It was super, super helpful. People found it really, uh, it was like if they were too leaf level to start, then they would kind of game it to try to get better. And um, it really became this very motivating thing as well as very um, educational. Um, almost everybody thought they were doing much better than they were. Um, so um, so as, in, in the course of reporting back how people were doing, we just kept in communication and we got to talking one day and uh, Jim had kind of already moved on to eating for the planet rather than eating for human health. Um, but we ended up deciding we were going to write a, a co-author a book where I would write the chapters about kind of applying this way of eating to, to personal health with my patients. So it told basically patient stories. Um, and then Jim did the chapters about um, about the effect on the on the environment and how much it really matters to a much bigger picture. It doesn't really do much uh, addressing um, animal rights issues. It really focuses on the health of the planet and health of humans. Um, and the, there weren't really books out there at the time. It was nine years ago now um, that it was published. So. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot. And, um, what was out there were things that were hard to read. Like the China study is an amazing book, but the average American is not going to sit down and read the China study. So the whole idea was that we would read, uh, that every chapter would be like four pages or less, and it would be kind of very simple, kind of straightforward. It's not every research article that's ever been done on this topic. It was something that was very approachable for folks. So it was a real pleasure to get that out, um, and to write that with Jim. So anyway, it's for free. So you can get it off the, the site that Jim gave before. You can also go to my website, which is Carrie MD, and you can click on a link to get a free uh, copy of the ebook for the Four Leaf Guide. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. One of them was specific for the, um, the Four Leaf Survey about how do we tell if we're getting enough omega-3. So that that was a I, I love how you kind of talk about that that question um, and why why it's on the survey. So why don't you tell us about that, Jim? Well, um, it turns out um as Dr. T. Colin Campbell will tell you, and Kerry Graff knows very well, uh, if if you're getting if you're eating whole whole food plant based, uh, you uh, balance out the the bad omega sixes, and you you lower the the really need for to have any omega threes, and so you don't have that's something you don't have to worry about, and so um, there there are no there are no uh, negative points on that there's just zero zero or or two or three points on it on that question it's just not a not an issue 
if you're eating whole food plant based, right? Yeah, we'll often say uh, recommend that you're getting a uh, you know a tablespoon of walnuts or flaxseed or chia seeds in every day, just as your insurance policy, just to get a little bit of extra in. But most of the time, you don't even need to even think about that. Um, the omega threes are the anti-inflammatory. The omega sixes are the pro-inflammatory. Uh, you need both. The op Optimal ratio is somewhere between one to one uh, to one to three. So you can have three times more omega sixes than omega threes and still do fine. But the average American is over one to twenty. Just a huge amounts of the pro-inflammatory um, uh, uh, um, fats and not very much of the anti-inflammatory ones. So you get the and if you supplement with omega threes, like with fish oil, it doesn't help your outcomes. The outcomes d don't get any better. So it doesn't really fix the problem. What you need to do is reduce the omega sixes, um, and you'll just get your omega threes in the in the foods. So. Um, there's there's some debate about whether when you get older you need to do some extra supplementing of omega threes if you're eating a whole food plant based diet the the jury is out on that so don't really worry about it for now just keep eat as whole food plant based as you can get at least a tablespoon of 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 walnuts uh, chia seeds or flax ground flaxseed regular flaxseed is just gonna pass through you it's not gonna get absorbed or anything um, but you don't really need to worry about it. Um, I had a question uh, you talked about in the beginning, you basically just gave this kind of flat out answer or that, that uh, lab grown meat is not the answer from an environmental standpoint. Can you tell us why it is not the answer? I get it from a human health standpoint, but you know, whether it's lab grown or whether it's grown on the animal, it's not going to be good for us, but why is it not more helpful to be, uh, for, for folks that are concerned about the environment and less so about their health? Well, uh, it's it's the raw materials involved. The raw materials you still got to have the corn and soy and all the all the stuff to put into the lab, and it's the corn and the soy and burning down the the trees to grow all that corn and soy that's it's uh, the the huge environmental problem that we have, and 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 the ju and the jury is still out on the health side of 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 eating lab grown meat. You know, I mean that ju that just seems bizarre. It's just crazy we should have never been eating meat in the first place our great ape ancestors don't eat any meat they eat nothing but plants and so so it's just it's just you know a, a crazy solution that that keeps the myth going that we can eat meat and we don't have to have uh we don't have to have animal suffering it it does get rid of animal suffering but it doesn't get rid of uh of the issues that we talked about and it's uh it doesn't get rid of the environmental issues it doesn't get rid of the health issues so it's just a high price uh exaggerated crazy uh initiative to to try to keep the myth going and it uh, it's just crazy in my opinion I had a, a question as well about why why do you think Eric Adams has been so successful with promoting whole food plant based? He's gotten all of the hospitals in New York City uh, to not only offer plant based meals, but that is actually what uh, they ha they have to specifically ask for a meat or or animal based meal. The default is plant based uh, there, and then they also have programs throughout. Uh, most of the hospitals there and the plans are to put them throughout all of the public hospitals there to have uh, lifestyle medicine programs that promote whole food plant-based diets. I, I know he's got a very compelling backstory, but why do you think he's been able to be so successful and not to hit politically? He's taken pol hits politically for other reasons, uh, but but he hasn't really gotten taken a hit on this for the uh, whole food plant-based promotion. Um, well, my, my opinion on that is uh, he hasn't really promoted it. I, I don't think, I, don't, I think he realizes that promoting what he's doing, changing people's diets is, is not going to be something that gets votes. And, uh, you know, he's got Michelle McMacken and a lot of people working for him. Uh, he know he knows better than anybody about the disease, disease reversing power of plant-based eating. Uh, and he's, he's taken that, that step of, of making it a reality in New York city hospitals. He's He's reversing his actions have resulted in reversing chronic diseases and probably tens of thousands of patients in, in New York City alone. And so 
for that we have to uh, applaud him and and as i said there's there's not a, an elected official on the planet uh, that it knows more about whole food plant-based eating than he does and he's the most recognizable name on the planet in a leadership role that uh that is aware of the power of plant-based eating and he even has one chapter in that book on uh called healthy at last uh one chapter in that book is about the environment and he knows he knows that as well but like i said if, if anybody runs on a ticket of uh eating plant-based foods, they're not ever going to get elected in this country under our current system of electing leaders, whether they be mayors, Congress people, uh, senators, or presidents. It's, it's just a non-starter. That's why I think, but he does have the recognition, he has the knowledge, and he could have some discreet meetings with those eight or 10 or 15 media people they, they all work in New York. He works in New York. They all know him. They, they've all worked in New York their whole life. And once the, once somebody like Katie Couric's light goes on, you know, Katie barred the door, no pun intended, but we could get, we could get a lot, a lot going once they really get it and he could help them get it. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I'm just, I wonder why he hasn't taken a political hit from it. Um, and maybe, maybe it's just too early to, to, to see that, or maybe it's because he's given people choices. So it's not like they don't still have meat on the menu at these, at the hospitals. It's just not the default yeah. anymore. And the programs are not mandated that you take them. They're offered. And I know that, uh, the lifestyle medicine programs have huge waiting lists. Uh, so there's a lot of demand for them. So and I'll uh, it's probably not very well known in the city of New York that he's doing that. The media hasn't hasn't made a big deal out of it, and I think uh, he knows that it's not a it's a non-starter for getting getting reelected. Nobody likes to think their mayor is interfering with with what they eat, and so like you and I and everybody else in in this field knows it's it's not a popular topic to talk about people changing their diets. But saving civilization could be a, a popular topic. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because in the lifestyle medicine world, we we all know what he's doing and we're super excited about it. But it may be that it's not really that promoted in New York City itself. So I don't know. Oh. So I'm going to read you what's in the uh, what's in the Q&A. Um, okay. uh, this person says, I often wonder if it is if it is truly not the cow, but the how. As I believe Dr. Mark Hyman may have said in Food Fix, perhaps some meat is truly not harmful for the individual's health or the ecosystem as long as it is only from grass-fed sources and farms using regenerative methods. What is your response to this? Well, if we're talking about human health or environmental health, there is there is there are no um, studies that I know of that if compare eating meat to eating whole food plant based that promote health. So they don't promote human health. And why did my mother feed me uh, bacon every morning? Because she thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, why did my father spend his career in the animal agriculture business? Because everybody eats meat, dairy, eggs, and fish, and, and, and he, was, he was doing that. But he died at 91. And at 90, he, he was in Dallas, Texas, and he called me one day and, and we, we talked at least once, once a week. And, and he knew my, my new mission was all about uh, plant-based foods and for, for human health and environmental health. And he told me, Jim, you are on the right track. And that, that meant the world to me. This is a man to spend his entire career from, from a boy on the farm to working for the food division of Quaker Oat Company and the livestock feed division. And he always had pigs and chickens on our little farm in Mississippi when I was a little kid. Uh, but he, he always prided himself on being willing to listen to the science. And he would take, take scientists with him on sales calls when he was selling the feed, the Quaker Oat feed to the uh, farmers because they had the scientific facts about those feeds and what they did for the animal and primarily their production rate. 
but he he would he would um he was willing to look at the different side of the coin and when he saw what i was doing and saw the results i was having with my own body uh he said my goodness jim you were on the right track I don't remember the exact statistics on regenerative farming and how much it takes in resources, but it takes even more in resources if you're doing like if you're doing a grass fed, uh, if you're doing grass fed beef, it uses significantly more resources than factory farming. So even if it were potentially healthier for us than the than than the meat that's producing CAFOs and factory farms. It's, it's not doable for the for the planet because it actually uses more resources and we're already struggling with having enough resources to 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 manage it as it is um so it's not really an option um unless you only want to have a you know one percent of the population eating meat then maybe if you could you would have a decent uh, uh impact on the environment with with uh, using grass-fed beef but you you wouldn't have very many people eating it because there's just not enough resources for it i think it's somewhere about uh i think it's somewhere about 10 percent or uh, sorry 10 times more um resources are used when it's grass-fed than in factory farms but i i would need to look that up specifically but it was significantly more it was completely not doable for for the planet so I totally agree. It's it's not it's not the way to go, and and it's not it's also not not the not healthy for people to eat it. You know, it's no more healthy than the other kind. So if we wanna if we wanna get it done, we got we gotta we gotta stop eating animals. Yeah, uh, Jill Brooks, um, who who works with Rochester Lifestyle Medicine, put in the uh, put in the chat about checking out Dr. Gregor's site, nutritionfacts.org. He's got a nice uh, summary on about uh, grass fed. Uh, I think it's beef. I'm not sure whether it's grass fed everything, but I think there is grass fed beef on that. And there's also a section uh, in his book, How Not to Age, uh, that addresses that. So, um, Bob Frank, you put it in the chat, uh, uh, reminding me that I, as I was talking about um, Mayor Adams, that he's also been a big supporter of uh, public schools serving uh, whole food plant based meals once a week on Fridays as part of their in uh, their initiative for healthier food. So, um, and I had forgot to mention that. I'm I'm saddened about the the news that uh, he's might be run out run out of office and and I don't know any anything about the reasons behind that but I do know that he's the only major elected official perhaps in the world that totally gets it about food at least that is open about it right yeah. and if you assume if they get it about food they would have to be open about it uh, because he's, not, of, he's, not, he's not being too open about it he's not. He's not having news conferences to talk about it. You know, he knows that it's a delicate topic for thousands of reasons. It's like a comment just about the amazing thing uh, is the amount of money being spent on climate change disasters and politicians still refuse to address animal agriculture. There's just this huge, huge disconnect between it. Um, there's a question that I want to go back to that kind of came up earlier. Um, oh, how can we also reach out to the emissions organizations to work better together. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are so many organizations that, that look at climate change in terms of emissions, um, but are not really addressing anything related to animal agriculture. How do you think we might bridge that? Dr. Silas Rao has come, uh, and we're, we're good friends. And, uh, I'll, I'll, and he, wrote, he wrote the paper, peer reviewed paper, in 2019, they concluded that at least 87% of climate change is driven by animal agriculture, 87%. And it's possible to get rid of all of it just by shifting to a whole food plant-based diet. I also know the co-author of the World Bank, uh, Goodland, Goodland uh, and Anhang. I was getting to know Robert Goodland before he died uh, about 15 years ago. I uh, met his co-author, uh, Jeff Enhang, and this is a World Bank paper that was not peer-reviewed as such, but I dug into that and realized that to get a paper published by the World Bank takes a rigorous amount of, of investigation internally to make sure that they're right. A peer-reviewed paper 
you know, it sounds good, but I wouldn't want to ask Dr. Rao how many peers reviewed it because I'm afraid it might be less than five or some number like that. But I do, I do believe Dr. Rao's con conclusions are right. And uh, he's, uh, he's about one of the smartest people I've ever met. But uh, Goodland and Anhang came to the similar conclusion. They said at least 51%, in other words, all bigger than all of the drivers combined. So if you if you accept those facts, you know, you, you kind of say, well, let's not worry about emissions because with emissions, you get rid of the uh of the uh the effect of of the when the emissions go, if the emissions went away quickly, the uh it would it would warm up more more quickly because of what is known as the aerosol masking effect. All of those particles are up there in the air resulting from our, our emissions from cars and trucks and factories and everything. If they all stopped overnight, climate change would, uh, it would, it would go up much more quickly because that heat would come right, right into the atmosphere instead of being reflected back out into space. So Silish, Rao is very aware of that, and he he calls for a gradual reduction of emissions while we shift as fast as we can to eating animal based uh, whole food plant based foods, and he he is uh, he's absolutely right, and so uh, that that's my answer to the emission problem. It's it's you got to you got to be careful about reducing that too quickly, but I don't think there's any danger of that happening. I mean, it's it's just crazy the uh, the amount of emissions and and the cars and trucks and factories and everything that we have that's that's constantly emitting emitting. Uh, the only danger to adopting a whole food plant based diet quickly is that you're going to be gassy for a few days, right? So you're going to be what? You're going to be gassy for a few days. Gassy so a different kind of a different kind of emissions. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, so I noticed uh, when I. Was, first started back in 2003, uh, I had made an appointment to go and get a colonic irrigation uh, to clean out my, my uh, whatever. Uh, and then I noticed after about a month of eating like this, I said, oh my goodness, my body is taking care of that problem, taking care of business. And I don't want to talk about it <laughs> in a crowd, but, uh, I never did go back and get that get that colonic irrigation, and I have never had a problem. I mean, it, it's just so the, your body just works so much better, and and when you do it quickly, you notice the changes big time. So I you're thriving because you're you're eating what your body's built to work as on. An adult in my fifties, I still had acne. I don't have acne anymore. <laughs> We are at the end of the hour and we are at the end of the questions. So I think this is a really good time for us to wrap up. Thank everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, Bob Frankie, who uh, runs the background show here for all of the things that we run at RLMI, yeah. uh, put in the chat, um, you know, that we make all of this free to everyone. Um, but uh, we are a um, nonprofit and we do need funds to survive. So please, if you can donate to help us keep going and doing our thing, we would really appreciate it. It and the link is in the chat. So I think we're going to wrap up, but thank you so much, Jim, for joining us tonight. And it was so great to see you up at uh, Rochester Veg Fest this summer and uh, and get to see you twice within, you know, a little over a month. Well, awesome. Thank you so. for joining me. This is great. Uh, co we we co-wrote a book and now we're co-producing co uh, a, a video here. So you go. Great, great you to go. have you as a partner again. Uh, all right. Well, good night, everybody. Come back for our next, our next thing. Stay posted with what's going on with Pale Blue Dot, and we'll keep you posted with what, uh, what, what, who we're having to talk and what we've got going on. So, good night.